Hey there friends, it's Dave Politis, K.A. Missing Project, copyrighted edition for our video channel. We're with a celebrity today <laughs> in northern Montana, and we're in the library. And we're going to do an interview with uh, Jim Myers from the Sasquatch Outpost in Bailey, Colorado. Jim spent some time up in uh, Montana this week with me, and uh, I want to get his feelings about, first of all, what he thought about Montana and the little tour we gave him around up here. And then we'll go into a little bit about uh, the background of the outpost and what they're doing there. But first, Jim, welcome. Thanks. Did Just, you have fun? Oh, awesome week. Awesome week. Have you ever been to Montana before? No, first time. So, so the first thing we did was Jim knows uh, the Montana Vortex. He knows uh, Joe Hauser, the owner. But he's never been there. Nope. So the first stop we made was the Vortex. Tell me what your thoughts were. That was incredible. I mean, I've heard about it from you. I've, I've heard about it from other people. Joe obviously has told me about it. But there's nothing like going to the Vortex and feeling the effects of that on you and um, doing the, all the, the, the many different stages they have in that place blew my mind i mean it was it was more than i expected honestly i i knew that the vortex had a reputation for being a kind of a roadside attraction yeah roadside attraction but it was so much more than that i mean this place as as we saw when we drove by a couple days after that I mean, it was packed. The parking lot was packed. So Joe and Tammy have have really built that place into, uh, it's not a roadside attraction. It's a phenomenon. It's really a phenomenon. So, um, and as Joe said, people experience it very differently, but some people can't even walk in. I mean, they go into the store and they leave because they can't take the, the feeling they get but I I found it fascinating totally fascinating so um, yeah it was everything I would I would have hoped and and more in the photos people are not gonna believe the photos we took when we were there <laughs> so one of the things I, I've talked to the audience about before is uh, Joe has some cameras set up there yeah that uh, he won't share online but he will share if you go and you visit. And what do you think of those? Yeah, those were some bizarre photos. And uh, I mean, how do you explain these things? Orbs and like translucent shapes coming into the frame and out of the frame and into the house of mystery. And I mean, it's just, and this is just passively filming. It's not like, uh, he was targeting, he was just waiting to see what would happen in this, these, these orb, orbs is all I can say. Um, uh, Joe, Joe doesn't even know what to describe them as. It's really, um, uh, and I can see why he doesn't want to show them publicly because people would scoff at some of the stuff that, that those cameras pick up, but um, you can't argue with, and you can't see it with your naked eye. The camera picks it up, but you can't see it. That's the bizarre thing for me. Um, but that's pretty pretty normal in UFO research or paranormal research, right? Yeah, it is uh, that that cameras for some reason pick up things that we can't see, and they. And I even tried it when we were there. I took selfies of myself and. And to see if uh, and I picked up anything in the background, it, it didn't. But it would be great to go back to that place at night sometime. That would be a trip. That would be a trip. Now, what about the, uh, there were some pictures and some video that he has that almost appear to be a, a Bigfoot related. What do you think of that? Well, he's, he's had Bigfoot sightings on that property more than one. I mean, probably dozens of them. And not just bigfoot sightings i mean guests seeing he talked about guests seeing bigfoot running away and and multiple people seeing it at the same time so you can't say it was one person's um 
mistaken identity or something. They all saw it. But even weirder was these shapes that come in that that are invisible to the naked eye, but are in the shape of a Bigfoot coming into a building or something like that. I mean, I can't explain it, but it tells me that, and you and I have talked about this at length, that there's far more to the whole Bigfoot phenomenon than meets the eye. It's, it's more, there's just more to it. There's, there's paranormal things going on that I know the Bigfoot world's divided on this topic, but, um, and we talked about that this week, that the things that I talk about in my museum are not things that I'm making up. It's just what I'm finding in my research. So I would have to choose to deny that stuff to keep from talking about it. But that's what I'm finding, is this kind of, the same kind of things that, that uh, Joe finds, um, I think happen all over the place. It's just that we don't all want to admit it. So Joe Hauser, Ron Moorhead, mm -hmm. you, me, and a handful of others have touched on things regarding Bigfoot research that many researchers, they call themselves mm -hmm. in the Bigfoot world, won't even talk about. Why is that so? You know, I've, I've wondered about this, and I, I think it's because my guess would be they're afraid of the stigma that would come from combining I mean Bigfoot already is a, a theme that is bizarre I mean let's admit it and it's a, it's a cryptid but then you throw in paranormal activities like disappearing Bigfoot disappearing or their eyes glowing at night or you know any of these phenomena that that I have personally experienced um, and I think people want to stay in the realm of what is measurable that these are flesh and blood creatures because either they're afraid their scientific reputation will be jeopardized by talking about something beyond that um, or they just think people will think they're crazy but they already think I'm crazy because of my, I mean, I run a Bigfoot museum and store. And so to me, when people say, when people come in and ask me, what, what do you think Bigfoot is? Or uh, what are the stories that you have? I tell them the stories, whether they are paranormal, have paranormal aspects to them or not, because that's what I experienced. So if I'm going to be an honest researcher, I have to say this is the data that I am finding, whether it's more bizarre than people want to admit or not. I mean, that's that to me, that's honest research is to say this is what I've encountered. I can't I can't explain it. I don't understand it, but I'm not going to avoid the topic just because it's makes people feel uncomfortable. What about the people that uh, draw correlations to some people draw them to religious writings, others to demonic writings, others to just strict paranormal and ghost. What do you think about that? I'm not sure what to think. I mean, I, I know that there are people who try to find biblical um, references to Bigfoot or what they think might be Bigfoot in the Bible, maybe in other religious writings. Um, personally, I don't find that to be the case. I mean, I, I come from a very religious background. Uh, I've, I've read the Bible through many times in my lifetime, and I don't see any correlation between uh, creatures such as Bigfoot and and beings in the Bible like the Nephilim and others. Um, I don't criticize anyone who does, that's just not what I think is, is the case with Bigfoot, but the whole demon aspect um, I find amusing because having been, having had many Bigfoot encounters myself, um, I've never experienced anything that I would call a demonic aspect to those encounters. Um, 
I have in the past encountered things that I would have called demonic in my previous life, but they were scary, they were they were dramatic, they were very unpleasant. That's not been my experience with Bigfoot. I mean, scary, yes, only because I don't I don't know enough about them, but to me the demonic the when you talk about demonic, you're talking about an entity that is evil that intends evil upon us, I don't find that to be the case with Sasquatch. And so, um, if they intended to harm me, they could have done it a hundred times over by now, and they've never they've never done that. So, we watched uh, an episode of Skinwalker Ranch <laughs> <Yeah>. last night, <laughs> and um, one thing we've talked about all week are the hitchhiker effect, where uh, somebody goes into the ranch and they bring home some type of entity to their family and the family sees things and suffers the consequences mm -hmm. of the researcher bringing it home. Now there's many researchers who say that they bring Bigfoot to their house and they've seen tracks around their house and they've had very very to the point um, visitations mm -hmm. by a Bigfoot at their home. So. You can almost call that a hitchhiker. Yeah, I mean, you could. And and whether they follow us or whether they, you know, did they not know where we lived before? I don't know. Uh, did they follow us back? But yeah, that's not uncommon for people to say they find footprints around their house or they have, and people that I've worked with who have, done research with and my team have encountered that where they after doing research with me and going out in the woods would find things tapping on their windows that didn't happen before now they didn't like that it was unpleasant for them but there was never any violent aspect to it it was just you know and in some cases these were women who lived alone they just didn't like the idea of something being outside their house tapping on their windows um, it's a scary thought but again the Sasquatch never never did anything to them that that even they would say was uh, was dangerous or 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 harmful to them they just were there they just were letting them know they were there um, but yeah, the hitchhiker effect, I think, is something that many researchers have encountered. Um, I haven't personally. Uh, I'm not looking for it, but um, I'm surprised it hasn't happened because so many people have found tracks. You found tracks outside your home. Maybe I just haven't looked enough. So you, you briefly touched on it that there was a woman that was part of your group that actually moved out of state to get away from She them. did. And they were there too. <laughs> they followed her yeah. there. She moved to Florida and she lived on the edge of a green belt and she would come home at night and see their eyes in this green belt and they would jump over the fence and walk through her yard and so and I said to her, I'm not sure why you thought that they wouldn't be there. Um, and her neighbor talked about hearing th things jump over the fence and thinking it was her, like my friend would jump over people's <laughs> fences. But uh, yeah, I mean, so she she encountered them multiple times in her new home. She's moving to a different home in the same neighborhood. I don't think it's because she thinks she'll get away from them. She just, it's a, it's a better situation for her. But yeah, I mean, they were in those, in the woods, in that green belt, uh, more than once she encountered them uh, at night. And so I just think if we look at them as purely flesh and blood creatures that would have to physically follow you, run after you, there's no way. I mean, there, there's no way even from the mountains where I live down into Denver where people have encountered them they're not going to run all that way. They get there some other way. That's my conviction. My my conviction is they're not limited to their t two legs to get where they're going. 
just because it's too far. I mean, it's just, it's, it's not, to me, that's stretching reality beyond, beyond what's believable. Now, them getting there a different way for a lot of people is not believable, but I don't have any other explanation. Well, there's, there's hundreds of people that you and I have talked to over the years where they say they've seen them run unbelievably fast. Yeah. And others have stated that when they run, it's almost not like they're making contact with the ground. It's like they're gliding it's somehow. It's too smooth, yeah. And then with your friend who moved to Florida, that's almost a, a continuation of that hitchhiker effect. Yeah. So... No, maybe they were different Sasquatch. I don't know, but they were there. She, w she was having similar encounters in Florida, so... So touching on a, another group with subgroup within the the Bigfoot world, the people who believe it's an ape or a gorilla or some offshoot of that. What do you think of that? There's nothing about them that I've ever encountered in my research that would tell me they're an ape or a gorilla. Um, I grew up in Africa. I never went to look at the gorillas. My brother did that in Rwanda, but. Uh, gorillas are intelligent. I mean, they they are they have a high level of intelligence, but Sasquatch demonstrates something immensely beyond that. Their language ability, um, not only what we've heard through through Ron's research in the Sierras, but my own the times I've heard them talking. Um, the the fact that they there's so much about them that's human gorillas are not bipedal they can get up and walk but that's not they that's not their preferred method of locomotion they prefer it on all fours and they're they never speak they they the language that gorillas have is very ape-like it's very grunts and screams and things sasquatch while they do do that definitely speak to each other and I think speak to us sometimes and so um, I just think it's honestly it's ridiculous to think that they are an ape or a gorilla and the DNA research that that you were heavily involved with disproves that in my mind um, from a DNA level says this is not it would have come back as ape if that's what they were and so um, I think a lot of people don't appreciate <laughs> that study because it doesn't bring the conclusion that they would want that study to have, to have shown that they are some subspecies of ape or something. But So there's, there's a fraction of that ape gorilla world that have said, well, I've, I've never had any kind of paranormal or unusual or supernatural encounter with a Bigfoot, so I don't believe it. Mm -hmm. What do you say to them? Are you doing research? I mean, honestly, that's my question. I haven't, I've been doing this for 10 years. I know people that have been doing it for 30 years. How you can do honest-to-goodness research and be in the woods and be putting yourself in situations where you can have encounters and not have anything paranormal happen. All I can say is from my experience, the paranormal has been a big part of the research. Both myself and people that I have done research with who have seen them disappear, who have seen things being cloaked in the woods, you know, all this, these things that um, other researchers might poo-poo it, you know, and I was encountering this in the first few years I was doing research, and it's just continued until now. And so, again, I would I would say, I don't know how you're doing research, but if you're never encountering anything that you cannot explain through a flesh and blood um, explanation, then I don't know what kind of research you're doing. So you introduced me to a, a man and his wife few years ago and I interviewed him at length and I'll, I'll release the story one of these days that were in the woods with their grandkids yeah and the story goes that they saw this Bigfoot walk away and disappear mm -hmm. now 
without going into details of the story, how would you rank that person's credibility? Absolutely credible. Um, I've known this person for close to 10 years. Uh, I have never had any reason to doubt his honesty or his integrity, both of them, their honesty or integrity. So if they tell me this, this happened, I have no reason to doubt it because I've never had any reason to doubt anything that they've said. And so, uh, and I ask people when they come into my store and they say, my uncle, my brother, my cousin said they saw a Sasquatch and they kind of laugh like, you know, that's so silly. And my question to them, and I've started asking this of people now, oh, so is your, is your uncle or your brother a, a liar? Do they lie a lot? No, they don't lie. Then why don't you believe them in this situation when they're not, they're not a habitual liar? And they don't have an explanation. I said that's, that I say to them, it seems that it's, you, you are <clears throat> not doing, giving your friend or your relative enough credit that they saw what they say they saw. Why would you believe everything else they say and then they tell a story like that and you say, well, that couldn't happen. Then you're putting their whole character up for question and I think that's, that's doing a disservice to those people. So if someone's a pathological liar, sure, don't believe them, but that's not what we're talking about. We're talking about people who in every other realm of life are honest, you know, hardworking people. Why would they lie about that? So my audience knows my trials and tribulations with the Forest Service and the National Park Service. <laughs> yeah. But have you had any uh, interaction with them about being transparent on this topic? No, uh, I've I've not pursued that with them. Because of your experience, I've not um, tried to get information out of them. And I've honestly avoided, I've avoided interacting with the Forest Service because I don't particularly want them to uh, know what I'm doing and where I'm doing it just because I, I have no idea what they if they would want to send people to watch or if they want to to know why I'm doing what I'm doing I would rather just kind of fly under the radar and I'm not doing anything illegal or trespassing or anything like that I just would prefer to remain quiet about what I'm doing and and let my research come out where I want it to come out rather than other people finding out about it and and discrediting me in the process. So um, so I haven't I haven't pursued that. So your store is in a great little town, Bailey, Colorado, and uh, I've been there many many times. Yeah. And I'm sure you get people coming through the door every day that question the topic, question you. And have you ever had people in the store that you thought, hmm, why would this person be buying that book? And you question maybe they're related to the government or something? Uh, only on a couple of occasions. Um, one time this guy came in, this is a number of years ago, came into my store. It was, he was carrying a clipboard. He said, I want to visit the museum. Didn't look in the store at all. I mean, didn't even look around. Said, I want to go in the museum. Went straight in the museum. He was in there for like an hour and a half. Most people who aren't really interested, if someone's really interested in the topic, they'll stay in there for a long time. Most people go in there and come out within 30 minutes. I forgot the guy was in there. He was in there so long. And then he walked out and walked right past me and left and walked out the door. Didn't say anything to me, which really struck me as strange that one, he was all business. That's the only place he wanted to go. He didn't look, he didn't, everybody comes in and looks around the store, everybody. This guy didn't, he just went straight in and came straight out, but he was in there a long time. Now I wish I had gone back there to see what he was doing. Cause I don't, I mean, it just struck me as strange, his demeanor, and that he had a clipboard. I wonder what he had on the clipboard, you know, that kind of thing. So um, other than that, it's the only person I would say 
I wondered about that because I've I've often wondered with other researchers if they've had people come and talk to them that they later thought who was that and why were they asking me those questions so um, I've kind of expected that to happen more but it it hasn't to my knowledge now I'm not in my store as much every day some of the our our employees may have people come in like that I need to ask them more do you ever have strange experiences just to find out if just because I'm not there, maybe they're experiencing something like that. But So in there, they have a front part that has a lot of lots of really cool merchandise, including my books. Yes. And um, the back is the museum and you have a lot of things in there that are from my collection. Yes. Um, most of the footprints are from your collection. Um, and I have, you loaned me more than I can actually display. So every once in a while, I'll swap some of them out so that people have different tracks to look at. But yeah, and they're from all over the country. And um, one question I wanted to ask you is, how many of those tracks are original castings versus a reproduction of a casting? Do you know? Probably 90% are wow. originals. That's what I've been telling people, but I had never asked you that, so yeah. I, I I hoped I was being accurate. But um, then you got a new figurine. Yes. Tell us about yeah. that. So we had a Bigfoot in the museum that I built, that we called Boomer, and he was pretty good. It took me a long Real time good. to build it. Real good, Jim. Covered with llama hair. I mean, he looked really cool. Um, but after a number of years. I just decided, you know, we need to up upgrade this to something a little a little more realistic. So I found a company in Ohio that build uh, monsters for animatronic monsters for haunted houses. I mean, huge, huge, very complex creatures. And I talked to him, and I said, "Could you build me two Bigfoots, uh, uh, an adult male and a juvenile?" And I want the male to be animatronic. I want his head to turn when people walk in, be on a motion sensor. Um, it costs quite a bit, but they said, yeah, we can do that. It took them about three months to do the work. I was, I was flabbergasted at how, when I went to pick them up, at how realistic they were, how well made they were. Um, uh, I gave them the soundtrack to put into the the system but so he makes noises and he turns his head and freaks people out and i purposely didn't make a noise like he's not growling or something that would scare kids but just the fact that he turns his head when people walk in they don't even see him usually until they cross the beam and it's so funny i can hear it from out in the store they'll be back there by themselves and i'll hear him go hmm, which is how he starts his little routine and these people scream or cuss or because they didn't even see him in there till they crossed the beam and he started moving and he's not like he's hiding i mean it's a little darker in that section but that just shows people don't look around and so um i'm proving a point by having him in there in a little bit darker area that people just don't look around let alone when they're in the woods and so it would be so easy for a Sasquatch to hide in plain sight because most of us are looking down at the trail. We're not looking up around us as we're hiking. So, You know what? You do your own little small survey where the people come in and you give them something similar to like a poker chip. Yeah. And then at the end you have them vote and tell us about that. So they vote um, before they leave the museum. They vote yes, maybe no. I think Sasquatch exists. And I personally do it at the end because I want to know if they were skeptic, did what they saw, what they visited in the museum change their mind at all? We, we have probably twice as many yes votes as maybe or no. No is always the least. So uh, now it could be because people self filter when they come in because they're already interested in the topic. Yeah and they come in, but um, we do get skeptics, and I've had people come in and say, 
I came in here as a firm no, there's no way they could exist. Now I have to admit they could, or some people have said, you convinced me um, that by what you have in the museum, you've convinced me that they're real. So if I, if I, I give myself a high five when that happens because they, um, most people who come in here skeptics will say, I saw everything in the museum, it was intriguing, but until I see one with my own eyes, I'm like, you know, there's so many things in life that you'll never experience yourself, but there's evidence out there. I just think they just don't want to believe, honestly. So, so I've never seen a 20-foot python. <laughs> yeah, exactly. But they exist. But they exist. Yes. Now, to that end, there's a film made in 67 by Roger Patterson and Bob Gimlin of a Sasquatch walking through a mm -hmm. gravel bed. Mm -hmm. True or false? 100%. 100% true. 100% true. 100%. And why do you say that? Because that, that piece of film is probably one of, if not the most viewed clips of film in history of filmmaking. Many of the people who've watched it are trying to disprove it. That's why they're watching it. And till today, they've not succeeded. Now, uh, there's people that claim that they've disproved it or claim that they were the ones in the, in the suit and everything. And I find it so amusing because I know one of the people who says he wore the suit is five foot ten inches tall. And we know that Patty was seven feet at least or more because of being able to triangulate her height against, against structures that are still there today. There's no doubt about how tall she was. Um, I think they've done a good job of estimating her weight and everything. To me, the biggest proof is that there was no way in 1967 anybody had the technology and the ability to build a suit like that. No Dis way. Disney Studios even said they couldn't replicate it. They couldn't it. replicate it. Um, and this, this is not a person in a suit. One, where are you going to find? These are two rodeo cowboys. Where are they going to find somebody to go that far out in the woods, have the money to pay them? I mean, to build a suit like that, even back then, would have cost more money than those guys had any dream of, of, of having. And so, uh, you know, and Gimlin's never changed his story. He's, what, 80, in his mid-80s? Yeah. He's never changed his story. Patterson never changed his story. People come in the store all the time and say, well, you know, Roger Patterson confessed on his deathbed. He said, it never happened. He never did that. No. You've spoken to his wife. She said he never did that. Never did so, uh, the, the other part of that is that Patty, the Sasquatch that walked through the gravel bank, was a female who had right. breasts. And if you're going to build a suit, you sure as heck would not have built Why? a suit. Why build breasts? a female? You yeah. Know? And you have to add all that complexity. Um, I have a friend who's a plastic surgeon who you know, I believe, and uh, he has studied that film at length with his perception and his training, and he says it's 100% um, real, and he can even say, I can tell she was middle-aged, she'd had numerous offspring because of the way the fat deposits were laid down in her body and all this, because he knows female bodies as a plastic surgeon. Um, to me, that carries a great deal of weight for somebody who really knows their topic and he said, it's 100% real. Recently, they, I've, I've seen uh, a special on TV where they took the film and they, they slowed it down and they, um, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Was um, it the locomotion study? Yes. How it moved? Where you saw, you can actually see her feet planting on the ground that a suit would never do that. I mean, it was phenomenal what they brought out just by, by with the new technology of looking at an old film I couldn't believe it, and I thought, if that doesn't convince anyone that this is a real creature with her toes stepping, I mean, 
that just that technology did not exist in 1967. Did not. And in this special, they actually talked about they brought in a, a person who tried to replicate the gait of it and the way its stride maneuvered, and they couldn't. A human couldn't do it. And I thought that was pretty yeah. impressive. Yeah. And even in the original film, you can see when she steps up on the bottom of her feet detail her toes everything is this was not a suit i mean uh, people make videos all the time now where they put on a gorilla suit or a, or a bigfoot suit and trying to convince people and i'll watch those videos and i think it looks like a person in a suit it's too baggy it doesn't fit to their body i mean patty was a living breathing creature muscles moving under the skin i mean I know Meldrum tells his students to see what muscle groups they can discern, and they they can see all kinds of muscle groups on her body. Yep. And um, if it wasn't real, you would never see that movement under the skin. So now, what I'm going to say hurts us as researchers, but I've got to say it. So in 1967, what percentage of the people that entered the forest? had the ability to film something like Patterson and Gimlin did. It's probably one in 10,000. Right. So today, what percentage of people that go into the woods have the ability to record? Almost 100%. So why haven't <laughs> anyone in the woods yes. gotten uh, footage that is at least as good or better than the Patterson-Gimlin footage? It's the, it's, the, it's the golden question, and I get asked that question all the time. Why is the best footage from the mid-60s? And we have cameras in our phones that far surpass that 16-millimeter camera that Patterson used. And so why has nobody, when we can pull it out and, and film it, he had to get that big camera out of his pack. And, you know, I mean, it was so complex. It was amazing he got what he got, honestly. And so, not just not just hikers and hunters. I mean, people going into the woods with sophisticated equipment, looking for Sasquatch today and getting no footage. And I don't have an explanation. And you're right. It does hurt us because people say, we should have more. We should have more footage than we do. Now, there's a lot of footage out there on the internet that a lot of people don't know about that I believe is real. And I mean, um, I'll say one, Paul Freeman. Paul Freeman, it was a name I was just struggling to remember. His footage is excellent. Um, it's not as clear as Patty, but I know he found the tracks first. He found the juvenile tracks first, which we have reproductions of from you. and which is fun. I use that video of, of Freeman now in the museum and I make a comment on there that those footprints he found we have in the museum. And so um, that gives more credibility to his story. But I've beyond Freeman, I've seen some videos that were pretty astonishing, but nothing that comes close to the Patterson Gimlin. Still nothing. Which is perplexing. It is, and I can't, I can't explain it. Uh, it's, it's a phenomenon that there's no reason why in the past 50 years we've not gotten something so clear and so detailed and high resolution that would almost remove any doubt in a skeptic's mind. And the fact that we don't have it gives more fuel to the skeptics. So Jim, you were born in the States. I was. Raised in Kenya, and then came back to the States to go to college. Yeah. What would have been the odds 20 years ago if I would have asked you that you'd be sitting here talking to me <laughs> right now? <laughs> Zero. <laughs> Zero. I mean, that was... The, the fact that I do what I do today is so bizarre for me. Uh, I would have laughed at you. I would have said, there's no way. There's no <laughs> way I would have a Bigfoot store and museum, that I would be a, a Sasquatch researcher, that I would be friends with people like you and other researchers. I mean, 
even though I believed in Bigfoot, that was so far beyond my mind because at that time I was I was very involved in in a religious organization and that was my focus. And so to do something like I'm doing now um, would have been unthinkable at that time. But it's just amazing how the paths that our lives take and I wouldn't trade what I'm doing now for anything. I mean, I'm thoroughly enjoying myself. I get up every day excited about what I'm going to do. How many people can say that with their job? So it was you and your wife that were deeply involved mm -hmm. in a religious organization. And then you and your wife, Daphne, both jumped into this world with both feet yeah. and have been working at it for 10 years. Mm -hmm. So you go to conferences, you talk at groups, and how's Daphne handled all this? You know, in the very beginning, she didn't know if she was a believer. And she kind of, she kind of humored me to let us start developing the Sasquatch Outpost. What convinced my wife was hearing witness after witness after witness who were credible people. She could not doubt their stories after you hear 20, 30, 100 of these stories of people who are highly intelligent, highly educated, from every walk of life, law enforcement, um, scientists, people who were not looking for Sasquatch and just had an encounter because they were hunting, they were hiking, they were you know, camping. And she just said to me finally one day, I can't, I can't say these people are crazy. I mean, I just can't. And I can't say that they've all seen something that they thought was Sasquatch, but it wasn't. It's just, it's not possible probability-wise, that this many people would be mistaken. Maybe we're all just mentally ill. Maybe we are. We <laughs> probably are, Dave. <laughs> a lot of people would say that. <laughs> now, in, in your shop, you have a map. Mm -hmm. Tell us about that. So we have a, a big map of Colorado. I think it's four feet by five feet. Very detailed map. And when people come into our store and museum and they have a story to tell us, and this happens all the time, um, I've probably heard upwards of 400 stories now. And they'll tell me their story or they'll tell my wife or they'll tell one of our employees and our employees know now to have them write it down, write their contact info so I can reach out to them. I mean, hundreds and hundreds of stories. And uh, so if, if it's a Colorado story, now I could be tracking stories from all over the country because I get them from all over the country, but I'm most interested in Colorado stories because that's my playground. That's where I'm doing my research. So I will take them back. If, I, if they convince me that it's genuine, I'll take them back. We have the map covered with a plexiglass protection because people were always messing with the map and the pins so we'll open it up and they take a pin depending on what their encounter was so we have different colors red for a visual encounter a class a encounter um, yellow for a tree structure of some kind green for some kind of vocalization black for footprints and blue if something was thrown at them in the woods but um, most of the stories are class a and so, but regardless, if they, if they convince me, they put the pin on the map where they say it happened. So there's over 350 pins on that map now. And all of them were placed by the people who had the encounters. Um, and so I think some people assume I just find stories and I just start throwing pins on this map. I don't. And, and again, I, I want to have integrity, so I, I intentionally bring them back in the museum, have them so that they would say, I put that pin there. And so, yeah, 350. Some are my pins, because I've had encounters, but most of them are other people's pins and stories. And, and I could, people ask me, do you have any Bigfoot stories? I'm like, how many days do you have? I mean, I could talk for days on my own experiences, but on all these other experiences 
incredible, incredible stories. So. so, you know, I'm big on maps. Yeah. And I call them cluster zones, mm -hmm. where there's many missing people in a specific area. Now, do you have cluster zones of sightings? We do. Um, there's a number of places on the map that, that we find more than one or many people coming in. Around Leadville is one, around Wellington Lake, um, in the uh, Mount Evans Wilderness. So there's clusters of, I mean, Bailey has a lot of sightings, but I think it's because my museum is there. And so anybody that has an encounter anywhere near our store knows that we're there, so they come in. Uh, there's my guess is people people are amazed at how many pins are on that map. I, I, I tell them, this is a fraction of the people who've had an encounter in Colorado. This is just people who've come in my store. Think of the thousands of people who have seen or had an encounter and never came in my store for whatever reason. They don't know I exist or um, they're not driving through Bailey. And so... I would say there's probably 10 times as many people who've had some kind of encounter and I don't know about it because they never told me. And so, and they probably never told anybody. It's happened so many times where a couple comes in the, the store, they're standing at the counter, the husband says, I have a story I want to tell you. He'll start telling the story. His wife's looking at him like, you've never told me that story. I mean, this has probably happened 10 times. You never told me that story. And he says, well, I didn't think you'd believe me. And it was, it happened 10, 20 years before. But the look of these women looking at their husbands like, what? And it's because the husband never was with someone who they thought would believe them so they could tell their story. And so that tells me most people don't talk about it because they don't want to be made fun of. So, probably the biggest Bigfoot group in the world has almost a policy of not putting up a Bigfoot story unless it fits what their owner believes is really out there. So they won't talk about anything that may be human related. They won't talk about anything that's paranormal related. True? True, 100% true. So their database represents a fraction of all the because they have a lot more encounters in their database than they put pub, public online and so uh, they have made that decision intentionally that anything that has any of those elements they will not they will not put that sighting on their public database i'm curious as to whether the other the others that they don't post are more than what they do post would be my guess but um, well we've got a really 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 good friend that's a state director for them and we kind of hear all the information and from him i haven't heard anything come in like that have you paranormal yeah um well and you have to define paranormal but um, most of most of the things that come into him are Class A sightings of some kind. Yeah. So, where are you going next with your work? Well, we've got a lot going on this summer because we have um, lots of expeditions that we've organized with people who have asked us, "Would you take us out?" And so we can see what you do and have an encounter. And so I do. I mean, I'm I have. From the very beginning, um, have wanted to share this research with other people. Uh, I know a lot of groups when they take people out, they they make them sign an affidavit of secrecy, and you know, I'll never. I've just never done that. Now, maybe I should. I don't know. But to me, um, I trust people sometimes too much, but I trust people, um, and. Many people who've been out with me have had encounters. To me, that and their minds have been blown by what's happened. And so I've got several more expeditions this summer, both camping, just camping, and horseback riding and camping. Um, having horses in the camp is a definite attractant. 
for Sasquatch. They, there's no question in my mind that they come in because the horses are there and and the horses help us know if there's something in the in the area because they're alert, way more alert than we are to what's going on. So yeah, we've got quite a few things going on. Um, my research partner Wayne and I have a gifting area near where I live that we'll be going to a lot this summer as well. But um, So if somebody wants to ride on horseback into the wilderness, camp for a couple nights, have some experience, you'd arrange that? I would arrange it. Mm -hmm. See, I don't know anybody else that offers that, do you? <laughs> no, because most researchers are, and I charge for this. I mean, it costs a lot. It's a lot of work to put this on. Sure. But um, I don't know. I know of a few researchers with the organization we were speaking of. They have big expeditions. But as far as taking people out, I know a couple. Most people are just doing research on their own. Um, or with a couple other people, uh, to me, it's far richer to take other people with me and let them experience these kinds of things because I've just added believers to, to the population who are going to support what I'm doing and, and who are, are credible people so that when they talk to people, um, they can tell them about their their experiences and that doesn't it's not like it, something happens every time we go out it doesn't and i tell people i don't have anybody in the woods waiting to knock on trees or you know they have i've been accused of that many times i don't have any friends that would do that for me go out in the woods and wait for two hours three hours i wouldn't do that for somebody else but i just wouldn't have any integrity if i did that that would not that would be so dissatisfying to take people out and have someone knock and you know it's a person and you're trying to convince these people that it's not so I, t I tell them whatever happens happens I don't have anything to do with it nothing may happen and you need to know before we go out um, we may or may not have something happen I, I can take you to a place where I've had activity and nothing happens but the most fun in my mind is going out there, setting up your camp, sitting around the campfire at night, and talking stories. Talking stories and then getting in the tents. And Dave, it's amazing. It's like they're, and it's not like, they are out there watching, and as soon as the last person gets in their tent, I mean, I'm talking minutes later, stuff starts happening around the camp. And so they don't want to come into the camp while we're talking, and I enjoy the talking, but it's only when we get into the tents that they start coming around. They just don't want to be seen. It's like Ron's stories that only when they were in the lean-to did the Sasquatch come into the campsite. So it's kind of an unspoken agreement, if you could put it that way, that uh, my daughters ask me, how come you don't unzip the tent and jump out and take <laughs> shine a light? One, I don't have a death wish, and I don't honestly think they would kill me, but two, if I start doing that, I don't think they're going to come into camp anymore. If I start trying to spotlight them, you know, I might have the satisfaction of seeing one, one time. But if I go back to that same place, I don't think they're going to come out because they're, they'll be thinking, yeah, I know what this guy does. He, he tries to surprise us and shine lights on us. I, it's much more satisfying to me, even though I can't see them, to hear them walking around my tent, pushing on my tent. I mean... And to have other people in my in our camp with us saying, "What was that last night?" You know. So, so. I've, I've told this to other people before, and you got to do this for me next time you go out. Take some ash from the campfire, and spread it around the perimeter of the camp. Very non-aggressive. It's a passive way to do research, and it's a good way to pick up tracks. I will try it. No, I've tried it with a powder that can only you can only see it through a black light and i've put that around the tents this was this was bizarre the last time i tried this i've tried it twice they've never walked through the powder because i can shine a light and see that it's undisturbed but we had the last time we did that 
just over from where we sprinkled the powder, we had a little gifting site set up for the two nights, three nights we were there of some colorful stones and stuff. The last night, something brought a polished green, like a gemstone you would find in a rock shop, like it among the polished stones and put that with ours. But they didn't walk through anything that we put out there. So they came around a different way, put that rock there. We still have that rock. And I thought, that's just like them. You know, they're not going to give me the satisfaction of walking through my trap, but they let us know that they were in the camp and they left something there. Nobody else knew that we were camped there, nor that we had put anything out for the Sasquatch to look at. So it's highly unlikely that some other camper had a rock. I mean, where a Sasquatch would find a polished green rock, I have no clue. I mean like it came from a rock shop. I mean, it was bizarre. But there it was in the morning with our stuff. So how many books about Sasquatch are in your shop, you think? Probably 30. Top three best ones. Uh, I'll help you with two, Tribal Bigfoot and the Hoopa Project. <laughs> well, of course, of course. And we have both of those, obviously. Um, and what I appreciate about those two books is bringing in the Native American side of this equation because they have a long tradition. Um, not many of the books delve into the Native American experiences. And so that's what I appreciate about those two books of yours. Um, and Harvey's art. And Harvey's art. Harvey's a fantastic artist. So, um, Do you carry Ron Moorhead's book? I carry Ron's book, and, and that's a very popular book. So I would say it's one of the top top sellers, and Tom Powell's books sell very well. And he takes a different tack on it, and he's, he's much more in the realm of what we're talking about, the paranormal and things. And, but he's a very good writer. I mean, you, Ron, Tom are all excellent writers, so people enjoy the books. And we have a lot of books that are just compilations of stories that people compile and then make a, a book out of it that aren't their stories or other people's stories. And and when people just want to delve into it a little bit, I recommend one of those. It's just kind of, here's a bunch of people's experiences. But if you really want to, you know, study and research it, then I would suggest yours or Ron's or Tom's books um, because it's, it's more than just stories of Bigfoot sightings. It's actual doing research and, and what you found. So um, there's some people out there right now watching saying, aha, I knew Politis was trying to align himself with Bigfoot and Bigfoot's taking these people. He's just not saying it or it's in his books, it's hidden somewhere. What do you say to people that say that to you? I say, nope. I say, I'd say if you read any of the missing 411, 411 books, you never draw any conclusions intentionally. And so people, I think, hope that you will. So they read the book like, okay, tell us what happened, what happened? And you don't because you don't know what happened. And so, and we have no proof that Bigfoot is responsible for any of those disappearances. We've talked about this at length. I personally don't want to think they are because I'm out there in the woods a lot and I don't want to think that something I'm researching is going to snatch me one day um, and it's never happened to me to anyone I've taken in the woods to any of the researchers I know who take people in the woods it's never happened the probability is that Sasquatch is responsible that I mean we're the ones out there looking more than anyone else surely would have happened to one of us so how to explain what happened to them you just have to draw your own conclusions but there's no way you could say in the 411 series that you're making a statement about Sasquatch being involved because you don't. So Jim, how do people contact the outpost? How do you, how do you get there? Um, through our website, which is sasquatchoutpost.com. Um, and that's, that's also our online store. 
but our address is on there. A lot of people find us just uh, on Facebook or through interviews like this or uh, news news stories that have been done on our store. Different. I mean, there's a lot of ways to find us if you just if you just Google Sasquatch Outpost, you're going to find us, and so that's the quickest way. Um, for people to know where we are. How far is it from Denver? About 45 minutes. Straight up 285. Mm -hmm. It's a very, very easy, easy drive and gorgeous drive. Yeah. And uh, a lot of good places to eat up there. Yeah. Make a day out of it. Come up, see Jim and Daphne. And uh, if they wanted to go on an expedition with you, they just need to contact me and either I can fit them into one we've already got organized or maybe set up a, a, a new one with them. But um, we'll find a way to make it happen. Well, hey, it's been a great week. It has been awesome. <laughs> we've, we've caught some great fish this week. <laughs> That's right. Tell people, hey, we go fishing and we catch fish, right? Big, big fish. I mean, I'm talking 20, 25 to 30 inch fish. I mean, phenomenal. Well, hey, man. Thanks for being on the show, Jim. You bet. Thank you, Dave. Politus out.